Praise God. Proverbs 24, verse 16. It says, For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. I feel to preach on this thought, come back. Come back. You may be seated. I'm going to ask the ushers to come back. The ushers co- coming back quickly. And they're going to go ahead and start passing out some Reese's to everybody. I'm just trying to get you all to come back next Sunday. And if you don't like Reese's, go ahead and take one. And you can give it to somebody later and say, come back next Sunday. But uh, please, please just take one. Don't fall into mischief and take more than one. I know you're tempted. Don't fall into mischief. And eat them during the sermon. Some of you, I think some already started unwrapping it. Don't fall into mischief. It's a temptation. All right, just take one, pass it, pass it along. Thank you, thank you. We'll work, work as quickly as we can. But come back. Those that have already received their candy, let your attention come back. (laughs) I'm sorry to distract you, but let your attention come back. You see, the word come back, it can be a cordial invitation to return to a place. So to all our guests, those that are here, those that are viewing online, again, we would extend an invitation, cordial invitation to you today and ask you to come back to church again next week. You know, some of the families, they communicated with me uh, prior to this weekend. They let me know that they're going out of town, and, you know, I encouraged them. And I said, you know, we'll be praying for you. Hopefully, you'll have a wonderful weekend and safe travel. But I lovingly said this, knowing what I was going to preach. I lovingly told them, I said, please, come back. But come back can also mean it can mean a return to an earlier or even a better position or a better condition. Lately, we've heard or we've read in the economy that we're heading into a recession. Experts, they say that the gross domestic product of the economy is expected to have a second consecutive decline, which is widely considered a a common indication that we have officially entered into a recession. Those numbers come out on July the 28th for the official declaration. And again, I know we're passing out the candy, but so bring your attention back. But, you know, when we look at the condition of the economy, we look at our society, we understand that everywhere we look, the the outlook, it looks very bleak and it might even get bumpy, not only for society, for the world, but it may even get bumpy for the children of God. But remember, that we serve a God who is above a recession. We serve a God that is above the GDP. We serve a God that's able to bring back not only the economy, but we serve a God that's able to bring back your joy, bring back your peace, bring back your income. We serve the God of a comeback. Oh, the economy may be in a recession, but I I believe it's going to come back. Praise God, because God is never in a recession. God will always take care of us. You will always be provided for. He will provide for us even in times of famine. So when you look around, now is not the time to worry. Now is not the time to panic. Now is not the time to fret, because God is in full control even during a famine. Jade asked some Some days ago, she asked what I was preaching, and I told her, I said, I told her my title, I said, I'm preaching on comeback. 
And she paused for a moment. She said, like a quick response. And I thought about that for a second. I said, yes, it could be. So a setback could be a quick, witty reply to a remark. But also a comeback, it could mean something else. When you begin to consider sports, everybody likes a good comeback in sports. So a comeback is coming from behind to obtain a victory. Brother Noe, I think you'll appreciate this. In 2006, Michigan came back from Northwesterner. What I didn't realize about that, it featured the biggest comeback in NCAA history. They came back from a 38-point deficit with nine minutes left to go in the third quarter. So the greatest comeback ever was Michigan State football in NCAA history. I'm sorry, Michigan fans. Everybody likes a good comeback. But in business, a comeback is a return to success. Consider the comeback story of H.B. Reese. According to sources, one of the most popular candies on the planet is not surprisingly but a Reese's cup, that which you hold in your hand. But the backstory of this is a perfect recipe to find not only the ingredients in the candy but in the heart of the creator, H.B. Reese. It is truly a comeback story. Harry Reese was not only a originator of Reese's, but he was not originally a confectionery. In fact, the very trade that would become his legacy at one point almost devastated his life. You see, Reese, he worked in the Hershey Company in Chocolate Town, USA. That's in Pennsylvania, Hershey, Pennsylvania. But he worked as a manager at Round Barn for the Hershey Company. And in that time, in 1919, it was a tough time in the economy and his position in the company. It provided him with stability and security and even sufficient income for his large family. But in 1919, the Round Barn, it was closed in an effort to save money. But Harry Reese didn't let that overcome him. He found himself the father and the provider of ten children with no job. You think it's hard providing for one child in today's economy? Imagine if you had ten children to provide for in today's economy. But under this pressure to support his ch ten children... And yet another baby on the way. Reese, he took up a paper mill job in a neighboring town. And after he took up that job, he took on a second job as a butcher. Then he took on a third job canning vegetables. Reese also, he started creating these confections in his basements. And he named them after his children. All these candies covered in chocolate. He began to name them after his many children. You see, he used fresh ingredients of his candy creations along with a large quantity of Hershey chocolate. And then later in the 1920s, Reese's basement-born enterprise was doing much better than expected. And when the candy selling successfully to the uh, local markets, H.B. Reese, he decided to take his business even more serious. And he set up H.B. Reese Candy Company, and the rest is history. Annual sales of Reese has surpassed $2 billion. Not $2 million, but $2 billion. Easily positioning it as the nation's number one confectionery brand. And to that I say, what a comeback. But if this type of comeback can happen for a desperate, determined father during desperate times, how much more can a child of God that has an unwavering faith and an unwavering determination come back from the tragedy of this world? The enemy may knock you down. The enemy may take your job. The enemy may want to take your health. But I serve a God that is able to bring me back. Oh, I'm thankful that we serve the God of a comeback. Oh, if you've ever been down and out and God has brought you back from the brink of defeat, give God a mighty praise. Thank you, Lord, for the comeback. 
somebody shall come back. For a just man, he falleth seven times. But even though he falls seven times, he's going to get back up. So when catastrophe hits you and knocks you down, catastrophe and disaster like flood and like fire like a tornado that takes out your home or takes out your family or maybe a hurricane or some tragedy hits uh, you need to get back up and say I'm going to keep fighting because I'm going to come back when life hits you and you have a loss of family members, and you're going through grief, and you're going through sorrow, a just man may fall twice, but he's going to get back up, and he's going to come out swinging. Why? Because he serves the God of a comeback. Life may hit you with heartbreak, and it may knock you down. And maybe you feel like you can't get back up. But if you can't feel like you can get up, I want you to think of the story of H.B. Reese. He never gave up, and he had a determination that he was going to keep fighting. And if he can fight for a business, you can fight for your soul. It's a enemy. I'm, oh, I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to get back up and keep fighting. I serve the God of a comeback. Somebody give him a comeback praise. What does a comeback praise look like? I don't know what it looks like for you, but for me and my house, we will praise the Lord. Oh, some of you, you're coming back right now. The enemy tried to take your praise, but you're going to get it back. Yes. Oh, get back up, child of God. You may knock down seven times, but get back up. Come back. Come back. Come back to the altar. Come back to a place of praise and worship. Oh, that's all right. I'm just letting those that want to worship, worship. Because worship is one of the ways we can come back. You see, God, he allowed Job to face many of these setbacks, unmet expectations, sadness, disappointment, death, loss, and tragedy. You see, Job, he lost his oxen and his donkeys. They, they were stolen. Setback. His sheep and his shepherds, they were destroyed by a fire. It was a setback. After he faced these two tragedies and these losses, uh, again, another servant came to him and said, Now all your sheep is gone, your donkeys are gone, your oxen, but now somebody has stolen all of your camels. After he received the news of this setback, there was another servant came to him and said, there was a tornado that destroyed your house and all of your sons and your daughters were destroyed in this calamity. But watch what Job said in Job chapter 2, verse number 9. You see, Satan struck Job from the head of his top of his head to the soles of his feet. But in Job chapter 1, verse number 20, then Job arose and he rent his mantle. 
and he shaved his head and he fell down upon the ground and worshiped. One of the ways that you're going to come back is when you get knocked down, you need to worship while you're down. You need to worship God and say, God, I may be knocked down, but if you keep praising him, if you keep trusting him, you will arise again. But he said this, he said, naked, and this is the attitude that we need to have. He said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return hither. The Lord gave. We can praise him when God gives. But he also said, so said this, uh, and naked came I, the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So when you're hit by the enemy, you need to get back up and say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, come on, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. If you feel that way, clap your hands under the Lord. Uh -huh. Somebody shall come back. But after all this again, he was struck by sickness. And in Job chapter number 2, verse number 9. He had a wife, and his wife began to discourage him. And it's kind of interesting. One time I heard a Christian comedian say he found it kind of humorous that Satan never took Job's wife. You see, there's people that the enemy wants you to be surrounded by. He wants you to be surrounded by individuals that are going to be negative. He wants you to be surrounded by individuals that will get you to go the wrong way and do the wrong thing. Hear me, you don't need to listen to the voices of those that are around you unless they're saying, you can get back up. You are an overcomer. You will come back. But his wife, his wife said this to him. She said, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Oh, some of you, you're going through some challenges. You're going through some trials. And you're trying to maintain your te integrity. I, what do I say to that? I encourage you, keep on fighting. Maintain your faith. Maintain your worship. Maintain your integrity. She said, are you trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. He said nothing wrong. How can you go through loss? How can you go through misfortune? Disaster, tragedy, and setback after another setback after another setback and never say anything wrong. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, give God some praise. Give God some, give God a comeback praise. Because he continued to maintain his integrity and continued to praise God and bless God. In the end, Job is a great comeback story. God restored to Job double fold. So I want to encourage somebody here today. The enemy has taken some things from you. He has taken your joy. He has taken your happiness. He's tried to take your worship. He's tried to take your praise. He's tried to destroy your prayer life. He's tried to take you out of the church. But I'm here to tell somebody, you're in the house of God today, and you're getting ready. You're getting ready for a comeback. Who am I 
preaching to. You're getting ready to come back. You're getting ready to come back. Oh, yes. Somebody shall come back. So, Dear brothers and sisters, if you feel that you've been set back by loss or failure or misfortune, trust that you serve the God of a comeback. If you are currently jobless, don't fret, don't worry, don't be troubled, and don't sit at home and do nothing. If you have to can vegetables, uh, you need to can vegetables. Uh, and while you're doing all that, though, uh, you need to expect uh, and believe uh, that God is getting ready to bring you back. <laughs> He's getting ready to restore you. He's getting ready to provide for you. Because you serve the God of a comeback. Because if God be for us, who can be against us? You see, if you fear God like Job feared God, and if you trust God like Job trusted God, hear me, your trials will be turned into triumph. And at times, though, the most righteous person that is here today, at times you have felt defeated. At times you go through periods and seasons of discouragement. And maybe that's you right now. You feel like you will never win. You feel like you will never get ahead. You feel like that you'll always be discouraged. But hear me, God is saying to you, you are about to have an amazing comeback. Oh, I know what I've heard from God. Somebody's discouraged, but you're getting ready to have an amazing. Somebody shall come back. Oh, hallelujah. You see, yesterday, as I was praying and as I was preparing, as I was at my desk, I had to look into my desk drawer. I had to look for something. And again, God had already given me, or I believe led me to the illustration of H.B. Reesey. And uh, what I didn't know under a piece of paper, when I opened up that drawer, I looked under a piece of paper, and this Reese was there. You can call it what you want, but I don't believe in a coincidence. It's not just a Reese. It's not just a dime. But I believe God is telling somebody, you can come back. You can come back. I forgot about this Reese. And you know what? From time to time, you may forget about one of the greatest, the greatest comeback stories of all time. You may forget about the comeback story of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It looked like Jesus was defeated on Calvary and at the cross, but he would not give up. Why? He was going to make an amazing comeback for all of mankind. He conquered death. He conquered the grave, and he conquered a hell so that you could, so that you could come back. Somebody shall come back. So it might look like you're behind or you're defeated by the enemy, but don't worry because God specializes in the comeback. I pray that every time you see a Reese's cup, 
that you will be reminded of this message and be reminded that you serve the God of a comeback. So when you're going through a challenging day and you see a Reese, you just need to tell the enemy, guess what? I'm coming back. When you're discouraged, uh, say, enemy, I'm coming back. Oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How do you come back? Uh, You realize that God is good, that God is merciful. Oh, put your hands together. Thank God for his goodness. So when Satan tries to remind you of your past and remind you of the tragedy and the trial and the temptations that you're going through, be reminded of your future and your hope that you have in Jesus Christ. Be reminded that you will come back if you don't give up. You'll see things of this world, they will try to control you. Negative influences in even people around you. They'll try to get you to curse God. They'll try to get you to leave the church. They'll try to get you to quit on God. But God never quits on you. If you'll just get back up, a just man falleth seven times, but he will rise again. So don't let negative influences try to control your mind and your life. Just say, blessed be the name of the Lord. So when Jack Daniels comes around and tries to tell you that you'll always be lost uh, and you'll never be victorious, uh, tell Jack Daniels, no, I'm coming back. When Jim Beams tells you you're defeated and you need to wash your sorrows away, you need to pour it down the drain and say, no, I'm coming back. For my Spanish-speaking brothers, cuando Jose Cuervo dice que estás derrotando, dice soy victorioso. When Jose Cuervo says you're defeated, you need to say, I am victorious. Oh, somebody needs to give God a comeback praise. Oh, if you, oh, I feel deliverance right now. If you lift your hands up now, you'll be delivered from it. Oh, I feel deliverance. I feel freedom. Oh, oh, where the presence of the Lord is, there is a liberty. Oh, go ahead and worship God with liberty. It's time for a comeback. You see, what we need in America greater than anything else is a comeback. We need a comeback to common sense. There's not more than two genders. There's male and female common sense. We need to come back, though, to morality. We need to come back to just common decency. We need to come back to loving our neighbor. We need to come back to kindness. We need to come back to respect. We need to respect our parents. We need to respect our elders. You need to get up when the elderly greets you. You need to get up and greet them. And come back to respect. We need to come back to respecting our flag. Respecting our leaders. But most of all, we need to come back to respecting ourselves. 
Oh, come on. The enemy doesn't want you to respect yourself. But I'm here to encourage you. God will restore your value. We need to come back like never before to the house of God. I appeal to those that are watching online. I know that there's individuals that are sick. But since the pandemic, some have not come back to the house of God. So I appeal to you, you need to come back to the house of God. We need to come back to repentance. We need to come back to prayer. We need to come back to daily Bible reading. Why? Because if we lose these things, we lose connection with God. And the enemy can keep us defeated. So if you've lost these things, how do you come back? If you've lost your connection with God, how do you come back? You've lost your zeal and lost your fire. How do you come back? Hear me, you go to the place uh, that you lost it. You go back to the place uh, that you lost it. I'm here to encourage somebody. You have felt that you've lost your connection with God. Oh, I know what I felt in the Holy Ghost. Uh, You come here Sunday after Sunday, but you don't feel the power of God like you once felt. Uh, If that is you, I'm here to give you a word from God. Get ready to come back. If you've lost your focus, get ready to come back. If you've lost your power, get ready to come back. See, every time, again, you see a Reese's cup, be reminded that you serve the God of a comeback. Consider another great story of a comeback. It's found in 2 Kings chapter number 6, verse 5 and 7. This is an account of some Bible students. They were in Bible college. And the, the man of God, he was training them and teaching them. In verse number 5, we pick up in that story. But as one was felling a beam, he, he was cutting some logs. and It says, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and he said, Alas, Master, it was borrowed. The man of God, Elisha, he said this. He said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and he cast it in hither. And the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and he took it. Notice uh, that Elisha, Elisha's Bible college, it started with students uh, chopping wood. I pause there to speak to all of our licensed ministers, all of our aspiring ministers. If you cannot do manual labor around the church, you don't have any business uh, of being in the pulpit. Every minister and every licensed minister, you should receive that and say, I will work for the Lord. You must be a carpenter before you're a preacher. Oh, Oh, God. Praise God. Praise God. Bishop, I may need just to go on there. But you see, the axe head, just like I almost lost power. But when he lost his axe head, guess what? He lost his power. When you lose your focus, when you lose your, your zeal, when you lose the power that God gave you, Again, the power that you have, it's borrowed. It's not your power. The only power that we have is from God Almighty. But when you lose it, what do you do? Alas, Master, 
It was borrowed. I need it back. I, I don't want to be an indentured servant. I don't want to be a slave to a master. I want to be liberated. Only you can deliver me. Alas, master, it was borrowed. But he cried out. He said, for it was borrowed. Why? He didn't want to be a slave for the lost acts. Head. Hear me. It represented lost freedom. And it also represented lost power. Why does Satan want to destroy your life with sin? Because he lost his position, and his power in heaven that God gave him. So now he wants to take your freedom and your power. And if that is you today, you need to tell the enemy, you're not taking my freedom. You're not taking my power because I'm getting ready to somebody shall come back. You see, we live in a society that there's a lot of religious wood chopping. If I just go to church, I'll be okay. There's a lot of religious wood chopping that's going on in our society. But hear me, there's few chips that are being made and there's little progress uh, that is happening. Why? Because the church has lost uh, its power. We don't need to deny the power of God. We need to get back to a place of holiness and righteousness and the power of an almighty God. Because hear me, the power is not in our own efforts. The power is not in our own ability. And when we try to chop down a tree or when we try to serve God on our own, hear me, at times we labor in the energy of the flesh. We try to go on, but we become weary. And when this happens, we become weary and we lose our strength to finish the task and finish the course. When we lose our power or when we lose the ability to keep chopping, we begin to cover our life with just busyness. We look like we're chopping wood, but we have no axe head and the power is missing. God never intended the child of God to be missing his power. That's why I believe somebody is getting ready to get their power back today. Who needs their power back? Who needs the power of God? Lift up your hands and say, God, I need that power. When the student cried out to God, it was a great comeback story because the man of God said this, show me the place. Show me where you lost it. You know where we lose it? When we stop coming to the altar. You know where we lose our power? When we stop praying at home. You know where we lose it? When we stop reading our Bible. That's why, church, uh, we need to come back to the basics. Uh, we need to come back where we lost it. You need to come back to this altar today. And if you come back, it'll be a comeback story. For the man of God threw in a, a stick in the power the axe head did swim. You see, we serve the God of a comeback. We serve the God of a, another chance. We serve a God of a second chance. And if God did it for Jacob, and if he did it for this Bible school student, if he did it for Joseph, if he did it for Samson, if he did it for David, if he did it for Jonah, if he did it after Peter denied him three times, then I'm here to encourage you, God will bring you back. But when he brings you back, I believe one of the things he's going to do is he's going to take away your shame. Hallelujah. He's going to take away your shame. You see, there was a lady in the Bible. She had an issue of blood for 12 years. 
And in Mark chapter 5, verse number 32, we pick up on that account. And she came and she desired to touch the hem of the master's garment. She said, if I could just get there, if I could just touch his hem, I know that I can be made whole. And when she touched him, virtue went out from the body of Christ. And he recognized that. I believe he recognized not the touch, but I believe he felt her faith. And when he felt her faith, he asked his disciples, he said, who touched me? In verse 32 it says, but he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Because the disciples said, Master, there's so many people around you. But what's interesting about this lady, she pressed from behind him. She came from behind. And then the frightened woman, when the Lord spoke to her, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. One of the ways that we're going to come back, we need to show God where we lost his power. We need to confess to God what we have done. We need to say, God, I have sinned against thee. Lord, I need your power. And when we confess, I believe God is able to restore. And then he said to her this. He said, daughter, he said, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Somebody's suffering is going to be over today. Somebody's suffering is going to be gone today. For you have carried shame around. This woman carried shame around for 12 years. I'm sure people knew that she was unclean. They would stay away from her. And she carried that tragedy, that heartache, that pain with her everywhere she went. Some of you, you carry the shame of your past. You've done some vile things, and you carry around that shame. Some of you, you carry shame around because somebody did something to you that you've never told anybody. They have violated you. They've abused you mentally. They've abused you physically and even sexually. You've been abused, and you've carried that shame around all of your life. But if you'll come to this altar and say, God, I need your power. You will be delivered of that shame. Would you just lift your hands up for a moment? Oh, come on, seek God. Seek God for a moment. God is talking to somebody. You serve a God of a comeback. You can get up again. You can worship God free again. How can I say that? Because I can tell you that I've carried shame in the past. I've carried shame of the things that I did when I was in the world. You see, I grew up in church. I had the power of God. I had the call of God on my life when I was a young boy. But I fell out of church. I let the influence of this world attempt to destroy my life. I got into the things you would never think a person would get into. Some of you, you've got into those things, drugs and alcohol. You did things that you're ashamed of. You got involved with vulgarity. You, you got in with the a grip of this world. And I carried that shame for many years. Even after I came back to God, I carried that shame. But one day in an altar, I gave it to God. And God said, that shame is not for you to carry. Because my... Hey. 
My blood that forgave you is the blood that will take away the shame. Oh, somebody, God is reaching for you. He will take away the shame. Oh, if God has ever done it for you, thank God for a moment. If the musicians would come. Would you stand? Continue to entertain the presence of God. Now is a moment to not lose your focus. Let your focus come back to God. Come on, let your focus come back to God. Hallelujah. Go ahead and stand. Bring your attention to God. Hallelujah. I... I'm going to invite everybody to the altar. I'm going to invite everybody to come back to the altar today. I believe that in the end time, hear me, I believe that in the end time, God is going to send a revival, hear me, a revival of taking away people's shame. Because in Joel chapter 2, Verse number 25. Please receive this. The prophet said this. And you can continue to come if you'd like. That's fine. Hallelujah. I'm going to give you some opportunity. Hallelujah. That's right. Come to the altar. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back to the altar. I invite everybody. Come back to the altar. Come back to the altar. Hallelujah. I'll give it people time to get here to the altar. Joel chapter 2, the prophet said, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt wondrous with you. And watch this. He said, and my people shall never be ashamed. It's pretty powerful if God's word says it once. But I believe before we truly send an end time revival, also the church, we need to be compassionate to those that have fallen and that are coming back to him. We need to help them get rid of their shame. So he not only said it once, but in verse 27, he said, And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And then he repeats it. And my people shall never be ashamed. It's after we get to this point that we see the end time revival. Church. We're getting ready to see an influx of Ephraims and people that have fallen away from God. We need to love them. Because when we love them, then comes the revival. And it shall come to pass afterward. Afterward. Then I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaiden, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Oh, if you've received the Holy Ghost, could you just thank God that you've received the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come back to the altar. Come back to the altar. We're getting ready to pray. And I believe the power and the Spirit of God is going to fall on every individual, every individual.
Hallelujah. Just lift your hands for a moment. I'm going to say it again. I believe the Spirit and the power of God is going to fall on every individual that will open their heart and their mind. Because you need the Spirit of God. Please don't, don't tune out. You need the Spirit of God. Why? Because there's another great comeback that is getting ready to happen. It's the greatest comeback outside of Calvary. Jesus Christ is getting ready to come back. But hear me. If you do not have His Spirit, if you do not have the Holy Ghost, evidence with speaking in other tongues, you will not join Him when He returns. It's the greatest comeback. But you can be ready today. For Paul said in Romans 8, 11, he said, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. In other words, when God comes back, it's His Spirit that's going to rapture you out of this world. How do you do that? Peter said this, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he said, repent, each of you. You must repent of your sins and turn to God. Can I say it this way? In the vernacular of this message, come back to God. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you desire to be ready for the greatest comeback of history... Would you lift up your hands? Pray to God. The Holy Ghost is getting ready to fall. Pray the Holy Ghost.